Good morning, everybody. Your Holiness, Gandhi Rinpoche, Sharva Choji Rinpoche, Changsu Choji Rinpoche, and the eminent scientists and guests coming from various parts of the world, Buddhist scholars, students, and lay community and students. It is my great privilege and joy to welcome all of you here on behalf of the Dalai Lama Trust India and the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives. As we are all aware that this initiative, based on His Holiness's encouragement and vision, has been taking place for many years. And I'm grateful that many of you, the eminent scientists, have been constantly supporting this program. The exchange and dialogue that we have together is not one to show or display who has greater knowledge, but it is a meeting to explore the depth and the richness of each other's tradition and thereby to see how we can best use those knowledges for the peace, harmony and well-being of at least mankind, if we don't talk about all sentient beings. Kindly mentioned that a kind of secular ethics based on common sense, common experience, scientific finding must be used to enrich the inner value which is so much needed today. Therefore, you are making a great contribution. Some people sometimes ask me, what did we achieve by all these Mind Lab conferences? There are so many things that we have achieved, but sometimes it is difficult to pinpoint one thing and say, this is what we have achieved, like a construction of a building. But the transforming the person and changing the perspective and developing a global or worldwide outlook and share this closeness together is the only solution for many of the sufferings and illnesses of the world. Therefore, I'm very grateful to all of you who are participating. And of course, I have no words for His Holiness for your initiative and vision. And during your stay, I hope you have a happy stay. And if there are anything we can do, I am the person to complain. Thank you very much. Thank you. During the last 25 years, we from the Mind and Life Institute have often gathered together as scientists, scholars, philosophers, and contemplative practitioners in your residence, in your other home in Dharamsala, India. Not so many people, but uh, We've been there very often to discuss important questions concerning the nature of reality, the nature of consciousness, meditation, and the like. Now this week we're gathered together once again, but now with thousands, thousands of teachers, scholars, students from your Tibetan Buddhist monastic universities. We come here from the US, from Europe, Nepal, India, in order to help initiate what is a very important new program of study, in particular the introduction of modern science into the monastic curriculum. I think the decision to include science in your curriculum is a courageous decision. It took courage. For centuries you have taught a curriculum without science, without modern science. So you must be asking yourselves why now bring science into our teaching and our learning? Some must be concerned and worried that science will somehow deflect the aspiring monk or nun from his or her path, a path that was first walked by the Buddha. You are all still pupils of that remarkable teacher who taught us the way through suffering to genuine happiness. What does modern physics, neuroscience, and the study of consciousness have to do 
with the Four Noble Truths and the Eightfold Way. It's my deep and firm conviction that science need not be a hindrance or an obstacle in any way or a distraction from the noble work that you are doing in the monastic universities of Drepung, Ganden, and the other great universities of Buddhist thought. In fact, if we take up the challenge of modern science properly with philosophical sophistication, it does not lead to materialism, but actually to a fuller insight into reality. And I hope in these days ahead, this becomes clear to each and every one of you. In fact, I believe it is only personally, I believe it is only by a union of science and contemplative spirituality that humanity will actually find its best way forward. You know, as I walk through the streets here, crowded with monks, and I see the beautiful buildings that you have for your monastic universities, or watch in admiration the vigor of the debates in the wide open courtyards. Yes, we saw the debates, right? We heard the debates. We admired the vigor, the drama of those debates, and we hear the chanting and the memorization and recitation of sacred texts. When I experienced all this, I was reminded of my own experience very far from here, 40 years ago when I was a student at my university with 35,000 other students on a beautiful campus studying physics and chemistry, mathematics and electronics, and only a little philosophy, I'm afraid. Yet as much as I loved those subjects of science, as much as I cared for them, I was profoundly unhappy and considered actually leaving and quitting my studies. Why? Because the outer learning of the sciences, as noble as it is, did not satisfy my deepest inner yearning. It was only when I met a scientist who was also a meditator and spiritual philosopher that I had a picture, an image of what was possible, how to become a whole human being. So only when science and spirituality meet, and they met in me, then I felt I was on the road to a true insight and compassion, only by the joining of those two. And so for the last 40 years, I've been on that path. It weaves together the threads of contemplation and scholarship, scientific research into a beautiful tapestry, a cloth, a tanka. And the story it tells is the story of my life of science and spirituality together at the same time. And it is for this reason that I am here today. Your Holiness, it is uh, an honor and a privilege for us to be with you in this setting today. Uh, when we first arrived here uh, at the uh, Drepung Monastery, Jimpala took us for a tour uh, the first evening, and it was uh, inspiring to be with him, having uh, uh, been a student, uh, uh, Jimpala, be being a student here for so many years, to see his return to this location and the very fact of holding a mind and life dialogue here uh, is something that uh, uh, is really a very momentous occasion, not just for your community, Your Holiness, but for us as scholars and scientists as well. We come with, I think, a very deep motivation to understand the true nature of reality in the understanding that that, uh, that that insight will help us to benefit other human beings. This motivation uh, is something that really is a core part of our work and one of the things that you have helped 
so many scientists, Your Holiness, to understand is that by combining the methods and the insights from the contemplative traditions with those of modern science, we have a better opportunity to have a more complete understanding. And uh, that is something, I think, which has helped us as scientists to cultivate more humility about how much we don't know. Uh, and this has been uh, so important in expanding our horizons of the research that lies ahead, the questions and challenges that we still need to address in our work as we go forward. The dialogues that we have been having, we believe have already had tremendous benefit in the West. Uh, we see benefit in major institutions of our culture. We see that the healthcare industry, that education, both of these major institutions have become so much more receptive to the importance of contemplative practice in each of these domains. And in large part, I think, it is from the research that has been spawned by the Mind and Life Institute. At a very momentous meeting in Dharamsala in the year 2000, Your Holiness challenged us to take this and really to start doing real research on this. Uh, up until that point, there had been many dialogues which have laid an important foundation, but the research really hadn't begun. And you, I think, in your vision, saw the possibility that um, research of this kind could be of benefit. We then had several public meetings that helped to catalyze the Western scientific community around some of these ideas, and research then began to actually unfold, and many of those studies have now been published in some of the most prestigious scientific journals in the West. That uh, sequence, those events, have been tremendously catalytic in opening up new areas of scientific investigation that many never believed would be possible at least so quickly. Uh, we now have uh, a field that is emerging that we call contemplative neuroscience. Uh, and Your Holiness uh, has played such an important role in uh, inspiring particularly the young people who come to the scientific education process with uh, a realization that scientific methods and the scientific enterprise as it's been conducted in the West while very successful is not necessarily complete. And uh, Mind and Life has played an important role in providing a home for these young people to uh, a community in which other like-minded individuals are pursuing these types of investigations. And this has been uh, just uh, such a meaningful part of their life, and I don't think they would be successful without the collective activity that uh, we've all been engaged. Universities today, major universities, are actually interested in hiring new faculty who have research interests in areas such as the application of mindfulness-based practices in healthcare, in uh, treating uh, psychiatric disorders like depression. Uh, it is uh, something that is becoming more and more mainstream. The National Institutes of Health, which is the uh, largest healthcare funding agency in the world, uh, is now giving more than $150 million a year to research on the impact of meditation on health conditions. And uh, I think, uh, again, we see this tremendously rapid change that uh, none of us, I think, expected to occur in the way it has unfolded. One of the things that scientists often do 
when they write a scientific paper uh, after conducting some basic research is in the last few sentences of the paper, they say that these findings may be someday important for benefiting other human beings, for helping to relieve suffering. And I think that Your Holiness has helped us to bring the practical import of this work to right in the center of what we're doing. And we are now, collectively, as a field, beginning to do research where, in the process of doing the research, we are benefiting people in real contexts by applying some of the methods from the contemplative traditions in ways that could help people and at the same time conduct our scientific investigations. It's been thrilling for us just in the short time we've been here already to see the, to get a sense of the possibilities of more significant interaction between our traditions. Last night, when we observed the debate, Jimpala was translating some of it for us, and some of the issues that were being discussed are actually issues about which scientific research has something to say. And I, I, I asked Jimpala whether he can envision a time when the debaters would actually bring up scientific evidence as part of their response. Uh, and uh, I think that we are beginning to see the, 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 the start of it, the, the foundation of it, here today with this meeting. And uh, it is with uh, tremendous uh, honor and respect that uh, we are here today. And I'd like to thank Your Holiness for inspiring us with this vision. Now since the major proportion of the audience is a Tibetan monks, scholars. Uh, uh, perhaps I think my explanation also, you see, need some sort of depth. Therefore, I prefer use my own mother tongue. <laughs> You know, sometimes it's a certain complicated subject. Uh, uh, my broken English, uh, the vocabulary is not adequate. Uh, so sometimes you see the rich Buddhist concept of Buddhist philosophy through my broken English, then the philosophy or concept itself becomes very poor. <laughs> so. Uh, Okay, okay, okay. 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 Test, test. It's Tibetan. Yeah. Tibetan now. Do you hear me? Okay. Do you, yes. hear, do yes. you hear the English translation? Oh. Yes. Okay, yes. So you have to tune it to number 92, FM 92. I think you also you can help. Nigi Nigi. Hmm? And the Ratu can be told. Oh, he, His Holiness is asking uh, Ratu Abbot Nikki yeah, to assist in translating to uh, the scholars around him uh, in the uh, presence of the Ganden Tirimbuche uh, at, at this great learning center with so many scholars. And I also heard that there are uh, many uh, uh, secular uh, students, secular students from the nearby secular uh, schools. Uh, I see them there. So that's why I thought that uh, it would be better for me to speak in Tibetan. Uh, on the one hand, the, the place where we are convening this conference is uh, this is usually referred to as the second Nalanda of ancient Tib ancient India. So this is considered to be the second Nalanda of Tibet uh, after the first Nalanda in India. Ever since the second uh, Dalai Lama, uh, Depung has uh, had a special 
uh, has had a special uh, connection with the series of Dalai Lamas and has been the main learning center of the lineage of the Dalai Lamas. And today here, as a part of the, the as part of the uh, the monastic institution associated with the lineage or the uh, line of Dalai Lamas, uh, as a member of this, the lineage, I. Uh, to those of you from the West and uh, foreign countries, particularly the scientists and scholars here, to, to all of you uh, here, uh, uh, on here, uh, in here to the audience, uh, led by the Ganden Tirimbuchi and his two deputy designated successors. On behalf of all of them, I greet our Western scholars and scientists who are gathered here and, wel and uh, welcome you here. Yesterday, yesterday, when we had a brief meeting on, uh, on the upper story, I jokingly shared with you, saying, uh, the second Nalan, the seat of learning of Tibet. Uh, here uh, we are going to meet with materialists uh, who have been specially invited here. But what is different is that uh, apart, f uh, what is different from the kind of materialists we used to meet early on uh, is that here uh, the uh, the. Uh, the members here are uh, not insistent on insistent on on their uh, positions as used to be the case with other materialists we uh, the ancient Buddhists used to meet with. Rather, you are very special in being very open-minded and always open uh, to whatever uh, unfolds in the process of the in the process of the investigation. Never coming up with a given agenda and insist on it, but rather feel very open. So in. Uh, 400 verses by Acharya Arya Deva. He, he comes up with three qualities uh, required of required of students or required of people aspiring. Uh, of the, the first one is uh, the sense of impartiality, and this is uh, one you all fulfill in that you are very impartial, impartial in uh, how you proceed with your investigation. You do not come up uh, with a set in stone position that you are anyhow going to uh, uh, stick to uh, with respect to. That's not the case with you, so you are open-minded in that, uh, impartial. And then the other is intelligence, one who is equipped with intelligence, one who is in equipped with insight. In this regard, uh, you are again, uh, you are again fulfilled this uh, uh, quality of being intelligent and uh, rational in that in whatever uh, you approach. Uh, for investigation, whatnot. this is the this is the way you have been trained for long, and this is how you pursue your search for truth. Uh, in that you pursue it with impartiality, equipped with, conjoined with a sense of uh, uh, sense of rationality, sense of intelligence, sense of inte intellect, and then the third one is enthusiasm. Mm, among the scientists here, uh, whom I have uh, acquired acquaintance for the so many years, even from among from from yeah, from even among the community of scientists, also you could be said to be a subset within them that you are not uh, necessarily content with uh, whatever you have found, but rather uh, searching for more and rather make uh, what you understand more complete. Uh, and not uh, confining oneself with mere, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, out-oriented, outside-oriented investigation uh, in the wake of which one becomes oblivious of who oneself is, what one, uh, what one undergoes in terms of experiences. Rather, uh, you are among those who have pursued your, per your investigation to the point that now you have come up with this, uh, with this uh, sense with this uh, sense of uh, affirmation that whatever you do should 
be uh, able to benefit uh, the welfare of others as well as should be oriented inside in terms of how it is connected with the with the, uh, with the practical experience that one gains from that. So I personally very sincerely think that you all fulfill all these three uh, requisites uh, that uh, Aryadeva came up with for a uh, for a uh, for a student for for a genuine student. Uh, yeah. I, uh, I am uh, I am known for my frankness, and uh, so uh, those among us within the a a monastic community, uh, we sometimes uh, tend to uh, rely more on scriptural authority. Uh, al al although in the case of Vinaya, monastic precepts and as Vinaya and Abhidharma, uh, of course, uh, one could. Uh, make an excuse that that's the way, that's the, that's, the, that's the area where one might have to rely on spiritual authority as much. But uh, in the case of uh, Mahademaka, the, the middle way philosophy, in the case of uh, epistemology, but now that should not be uh, the case. Uh, so there one should be very clear in how to pursue pursue the search by relying more on rationality. Uh, where, uh, say, if if the subject of investigation is uh, what we what we call uh, extremely uh, hidden, then there might be an exception that there the direct reasoning might be uh, scriptural, scripturally oriented. But there too, one has to uh, build the basic foundation uh, for uh, allegiance to those uh, statements uh, on the basis of one's evidence and uh, findings uh, support, su supported by, uh, by uh, rationality. So in this case, sometimes even the scientists might excel us in their being so impartial and rational oriented. And then another thing uh, another thing is that uh, very often we find, uh, though sadly, uh, that uh, some, after pursuing their studies, they do not seem to have pursued it with a sense of benefiting others, although there may be many who, who would pursue it so, but not uh, everyone is... Uh, uh, everyone pursues it this way, and thus what becomes very evident is, is that at the point they finish their studies, then they uh, right away uh, take off to the Western countries and then use whatever their understandings to earning uh, dollars, to, uh, to earning money, material possessions. So that, that's, the, that's sometimes the case with uh, some uh, students, although that's not the case, of course, for everyone, because we have seen through the course of history that so many uh, wonderful masters with, with benevolence uh, core at their heart uh, have been produced and have uh, uh, served humanity on a large scale through their own practice, through their own uh, teachings and whatnot. So that's how I see those of you who are present here and others associated with you uh, fulfill those three qualities of being a genuine student, a qualified student. So you are special in that you still uh, maintain intact your scientific standpoint, standpoint in pursuing the search through a scientific rigor, or scientific rigor and scientific perspective. Yet at the same time you have this additional perspective of uh, being oriented inward and looking for how, how what you learn and what you investigate is then connected to becoming becoming uh, a better person in terms of, in terms of in terms of in terms of uh, 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 making inner improvement. I wanted to make this point very clear because otherwise people would uh, people might uh, come with this feeling that oh, his holiness himself has started giving up on some principles of the Buddhist, including acceptance of Mount Mary, etc. And that now he is not only giving it to himself, but rather expanding it to others and on a larger scale to the such a monastery and making everyone kind of uh, go in that direction. So that's not the case.
Now it has been for some time. Uh, yes, uh, if we if we look back to the history of uh, mankind, uh, we see how when people meet with difficulties, uh, uh, seeing that the problems before them are overwhelming, that they would uh, resort to look for uh, some power beyond them. That's the, and that's how faith into supernatural uh, phenomena happened, and that's how people carried on for the next 4,000, 5,000 years. And then eventually, uh, people began to investigate a little more, and to, uh, thereby exerting their own uh, potential more. And through that, they use uh, they use uh, uh, tools. Uh, to investigate uh, their field of search. In this regard, in this regard, I see a parallel uh, between uh, the Buddhists and the scientists in that in, scientific, in Buddhist teachings we can have, uh, uh, yeah, we have the presentation of the four kinds of reasonings, four kinds of reasonings. Uh, of which uh, one is that of natural reasoning, uh, natural reason in that one has to allude to the natural uh, working of phenomena uh, based on that, and we come up with uh, the additional reasonings uh, uh, such as that of the function and that of uh, the validity, uh, reasonability, etc. So, uh, in terms of the tools that we use, it seems like uh, we have a, a parallel ground there. Uh, but in the case of scientists, although they seem to basically uh, 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 touch base with these four strands of rationality, and strands of reasoning, but uh, have over the course of time uh, improved on that and have improved on the implements and have even advanced them so that their field of sur search could be pushed a little be beyond the apparent and thus be able to uh, uh, make uh, f more finer uh, researches. At the same time, what has uh, become apparent is that this So uh, over the course of uh, history, what has evolved is that those who uh, primarily rely on faith or primarily rely on belief uh, happen to be associated with the, uh, the uh, religious institutions, whereas those who pursued science uh, relying mainly on rationality and in, uh, rely on tools have uh, uh, begun to be more reasoning oriented. But then, uh, uh, through the course of the history, what has become apparent that from the scientific community pursuing uh, reason and uh, materi material evi evidences, uh, uh, they also experience inner uh, distortion, inner imbalances. And because of that, uh, being felt at the, on the individual level, uh, that expands out, is reflected on the society, and thus in the society, uh, several evidences of social unrest uh, have become apparent, have become spread out. Through that, uh, people have been forced to kind of reflect back into themselves in terms of what causes this. And this has uh, uh, made uh, people are concerned in this area, more particularly the scientific community, to kind of orient themselves more into developing the inner values, inner qualities for which inspirations are found in religious uh, teachings uh, uh, across the board, uh, not necessarily confined to one particular religion. And this is my part, individual belief also. Uh, I sincerely believe that all the religious traditions, major religious traditions, particularly 
particularly those who are backed with philosophical background have that potential to serve humanity uh, in that respect of uh, building our inner values. But then, from among them, uh, those traditions, those religious traditions found in the East, uh, which primarily have uh, very rich uh, teaching uh, sources in developing serenity, in developing insight, uh, uh, insightful meditation. They seem to have a special added uh, resource of uh, very rich uh, mental uh, techniques. Uh, 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 with a detailed explanation of the workings of the mind, more particularly uh, in terms of uh, understanding the workings of uh, negative emotions, destructive emotions, uh, going into detail of the mechanism of how they arise and how to tackle them. Uh, and uh, through that, through, through uh, because of this uh, reality from the scientific community with their concern led to uh, looking deeper into the into the science of brain how uh, the different mental uh, states affect them uh, change them structurally fun fun functionally and uh, through that uh, through that their attention had been led to these traditions which reach explanation of the workings of mind and mental states uh, so in this regard I want to expound uh, more from the Buddhist perspective, Nagarjuna very clearly states that uh, Buddha didn't say that the, the sufferings are a natural thing that are bound to happen no matter what. That's not the stand. Freedom or freedom of will? Free will. Or free will. Free will, Janiyama. Uh, yeah, at the same time, there are, uh, there are at the same time there are other traditions. Well, yes, 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 yes. Uh, Nagarjuna is quoted here, where he says that uh, uh, among the schools of thought, among the schools of thought, uh, they differ in their stand of where the sufferings come. Either they come from their own self, or they come from others, or they come from from uh, from from the combination of thought. Oh, but this is not the case with the Buddhist, whereas the, the Buddhists rather say uh, their stand is that the sufferings come uh, come uh, from their own respective causes and conditions, and within the causes and conditions, uh, that the uh, sufferings are uh, uh, sufferings depend on. Uh, they come from ignorance. They come from delusion. And that's what the Buddhist stand is. And then the second reasoning, second reflection comes that the, mission, that, that the delusion has to be addressed. Delusion has to be addressed if one doesn't want suffering. And from among the delusions, there are two types. One is mere non-knowledge, and the other is a kind of a distorted apprehension. And and among the two, uh, the later one is more serious in that it comes up with a more specific mode of apprehension which is distorted uh, and which is not in conformity with the reality. For that, mere prayer is not going to help in changing it, but rather has to be addressed accordingly through coming up with the rightful understanding. Uh, in the epistemological uh, teachings, uh, uh, courses. It says that whatever we aspire for, they can be achieved through the help of a valid cognition. And among the valid cognition-driven benefits, it could be either valid cognition uh, mediated, uh, mediated continuously or, or mediated sporadically, but how, somehow they are all valid cognition mediated results. And from among them, the result of the result of uh, overcoming the uh, misknowledge delusion has to has to come up uh, with a well informed understanding, uh, well uh, informed uh, understanding. Uh, 
uh, from among the distortions uh, or misknowledge uh, with a specific mode of apprehension, uh, one could say that there can be one which involves superimposing some exaggeration or the other that kind of underrates uh, what the reality is. Uh, so, so again here with regard to the method of addressing it has to be uh, done accordingly also. Not that any kind of valid cognition would do, have to be done accordingly. Uh, so thus, uh, every result, uh, every result that we aspire for, more particularly in regard to the success in overcoming suffering, has to be valid cognition driven, either uh, mediatedly or, or either continuously mediatedly by valid cognition or sporadically mediated, but, but has to be driven somehow by the valid cognition. That's the reason why Buddha has taught his disciples not to rely merely on his words out of devotion, but rather investigate uh, uh, the things for themselves and come to confirmation uh, with regard to the workings of it. And the reason, main, one specific reason uh, for his urge for investigation, carrying out investigation, is because that even in his own teachings also he he's, uh, he uh, deals with the situation accordingly, and not out of whim or not out of impulse, but rather with what would correspond with the situation. So that's how there were teachings which could not be taken literally, and there are others which could be taken literally, and there are others which address just the superficial problem, not the deep uh, deep layers, but others that specifically deal. With the deep layers, etc. So that's the reason, even from among the very teachings also, there's the need of investigating it further rather than taking things on the uh, face value. So I think it's, it's, it's in the work of uh, our Sangha, uh, where he says that uh, uh, from among the two person and the teachings, uh, one has to rely more on the teaching. On among the teachings, one has to rely not on the words but on the meaning. From among the meaning, one has to rely more on uh, the uh, the uh, definitive meaning but not the interpretive meaning. And from among the definitive meanings, then one has to rely more on the wisdom, uh, exalted wisdom, but not on the adv uh, not on the advantageous knowledges. Although on this regard uh, some more deliberation need to be done it is more deeper but somehow this very clearly shows that uh, the preference should be in investigating and uh, relying on the finding through such real investigation rather than uh, relying fully or solely on faith so that's the emphasis there so one thing very clear is the emphasis on relying on reasoning so for so for our case also, just as the saying says that uh, it has to be driven through, it has to be driven through inferences, but inferences ultimately rooted in perception. And that's because, uh, of course, that, that would be the case with the extremely hidden phenomena, and so is the case with the slightly hidden also, uh, that uh, that their, their understanding have to be understanding a uh, reliable understanding have to be driven through uh, through reasoning through rationalization, uh, which would then ultimately be rooted uh, on a perception. So that's that's how uh, it all boils down to the perception uh, to the empirical perception, empirical finding. So that we see that our reasonings, the strength of the reasoning has to be ultimately rooted in perception, the empirical perception. Uh, with regard to the field of empirical perception, here the scientists are, are far ahead in their uh, methods of investigation, in their findings, in their uh, searches, in their involvement, etc. So, so that's how, in terms of topics like dealing uh, with the working of uh, uh, special mental states in the sector, they have to be rooted in perception uh, in the sense of what we ourselves uh, experience. 
So here we see two different, two different types uh, of what might constitute the perceptual field. One that is perceptually seen through the sense faculties, and another one which is perceptually experienced within. So, so far the scientific investigation has, of course, been rooted or grounded or, or uh, has started their starting point on the perception, but more on the perceptual fields of the sense faculties, uh, not, ra not so much on the perceptual experience of the inner consciousness. And that is uh, because, understand, that is understandable because that is much uh, more difficult uh, to pursue from there. So that's how, so far, the scientific field of investigation has mainly been confined in this world of the outer world, though rooted in the perception and the perceptual fields through the failed faculties. But then, over the course of a year now, things are beginning to change in that their attention is, be, uh, is being driven more inward into the uh, empirical perception of the experiences, uh, inner experience of individual, since that has much greater uh, what do you call, uh, connection uh, with the actual, actual experiences. So in this regard, uh, it may be just a case of where we have emphasized more or not, or where uh, each of the traditions emphasize more or not, but I don't see a contradiction there. There's not a head-on head, head collision there uh, in any way, in, even in terms of the, in, even in in terms of the uh, method, in terms of the pursuit, uh, I don't see any contradiction. I particularly remember very clearly when I personally have been advised, uh, have been talked out of such a conversation, or pursuing such a conversation by others, although with sincerity. But I have always been uh, primarily uh, driven uh, by the teaching, by the insight in Buddhism that one has to base one's understanding experience uh, through investigation. Uh, so, 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 so here, whatever investigation you undertake, uh, it has to be all, uh, geared uh, towards searching the truth. That, that will have the effect of dispelling uh, one's distortion of the reality, be that in the sense of under underestimation or in the sense of overestimation. And in terms of the field of investigation, scientists, the Buddhists come up with three major fields of investigation, fields of phenomena, now evident, the evident one, the slightly hidden, and the extremely hidden, whereas the scientists so far have mainly been uh, uh, involved uh, with the evident empirical world, uh, living out the less evident and the st uh, extremely uh, evident ones. But then in this field, uh, the way the scientists have uh, advanced is really impressive in that, say, uh, in, the, in the case of the empirical uh, things in terms of their uh, being uh, 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 ephemeral, ephemeral and changing and whatnot, uh, they, the scientists, in the, the connection with the scientists involved with them getting, uh, uh, getting to uh, uh, involved with them has really helped me in my understanding of the, in, the subtle impermanent nature of things in that through the use of tools in this, uh, instruments I have been even being able to observe the, 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 the constant influx of things more uh, clearly and more directly. And uh, likewise, so goes the same with the concept of non-self. We have been always been pursuing, uh, pressing that yes, there is no uh, what do you call it, intrinsically or uh, uh, intrinsically independent self out there uh, that, that could be uh, uh, that that could be approached. That, that could be uh, the light. The light. The light has just gone. Is it still working? Yeah. Uh, so even in the case of the concept of non-self, uh, uh, with my involvement with the scientists through their findings in the uh, uh, field of the working, working, working uh, of, of brain, I have really benefited from this, and my understanding on Buddhism has really increased. The only casualty you might call is the belief in Mount Meru. Uh, uh, that. That may be the only ca casualty, but in terms of all other uh, other uh, uh, 
realms of understanding uh, have re been really appreciative of this involvement that has really benefited me personally and likewise the, the rest of our community could look forward to this and as we have heard even from the scientific uh, uh, community they have acknowledged that they have also benefited from this so this kind of a, a convergence a dialogue has really benefited uh, uh, mutually so that's the reason why I, I, from my own experience from my, how I personally gained from this I have been pressing that this could be uh, broadened and institutionalized uh, so that the entire community uh, could uh, uh, make uh, 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 get benefit out of that. And in this regard, we have pursued initially uh, with uh, giving scientific teaching, uh, scientific instructions to select a few of uh, monastics from different monasteries and whatnot. We have pursued that for the last four or five years. But now has come a time where we are making the plunge in making it more broad-based. And now, very soon, we are coming to the time uh, when uh, uh, officially the courses in science would be incorporated into the monastic curriculum. And uh, because of this uh, upcoming eminent uh, phenomena, eminent phenomena, eminent change uh, have proposed that this uh, this uh, mind and life teaching uh, mind and life conference be convened at the monastic setting uh, the benefit from that is that uh, just as we have heard from the scientists, scientific community, they said that just from the past two days of the observation, they have been really impressed with what they have seen. And, uh, and also they had the opportunity to witness the uh, debate, uh, uh, the major debate uh, uh, congregation happening in Ghana. And I personally, I wish I could come there, but uh, somehow from the uh, the persistent teachings that I have been giving of the uh, of the past many uh, weeks and months, uh, I still don't feel uh, I still don't feel uh, uh, quite uh, well uh, in my throat, uh, so I still feel some hoarse and whatnot. So that's the reason why I could not make there, uh, and uh, I gathered from. Uh, the scientists that uh, apparently you had discussed uh, uh, the conception of self, uh, the conception of self as the focus of debate last night, which they observed, and as we saw them bring this up in their uh, observation. Now, in this regard, one thing uh, very uh, uh, Yeah, one thing interesting about the conception of self is that irrespective of whether a particular religion come up so pronounced and so uh, refined in terms of what it is constituted or how to address that or what not, uh, because uh, either directly or indirectly they do seem to address this conception of self-centeredness, of this conception of uh, holding on to an absolute concept of oneself. But one thing special about Buddhism is that it has a very pronounced, a very refined understanding of what constitutes this conception of self, how, what are its implications, how at, uh, are the ways of addressing it, and how that would have the impact of uh, um, advancing one's uh, welfare. So this is uh, uh, the particular, uh, the specific about uh, Buddhism. In the case of the monastic community here, uh, the people have been pursuing their studies years after year, uh, and some have been very, very uh, successful in this. But one thing that I want to remind them is that the way that we have come to uh, preserve the tradition of Nalanda is through the combination of study, reflection, and meditation. And that's the main way how we have preserved it. And I hope that through your investigation, through the, your uh, uh, 
through, through your observation, I hope that this will become more evident. And like, at the same time, I also hope that uh, through these deliberations, by witnessing this, 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 uh, this uh, dialogue, I very much hope that the monks uh, would come out with the impression that the scientists too are involved with very profound topics in their observation, in their investigation and would have some sense of what might have been going on in the past many years in Dharamsala, in the past many years in Dharamsala, in terms of the dialogues. So that's the reason uh, why uh, I have proposed for this meeting to be uh, held here. However, the, all the scientists with their, their full dedications, with the interest, they have come here from far away. And this uh, meeting with great scientists and how it develops, what is the reason behind? And in another sense, I remember very vividly in the year 1955. When I from Beijing, went from Beijing, Mao Zedong, I met Mao Zedong often, many times. And the last day on which I met him, he said, he told me that you, the way you think, it's like a scientist. You think like a scientist. And then after that, in the year 1960s, in Tibet, there's so many letters which are released from Tibet. And I believe that is blind faith. All the you know the, the religion, the Buddhism is a blind faith. And then Mozart also said, you know, like that the letter came out from Tibet saying that all the the, the belief, the Buddhist philosophy is nothing but the blind faith. So it uh, you know the Tibet, Tibetans, the Buddhism, uh, Tibetan needs to overcome that. Now, <coughs> now that the scientists are real, I'm not talking about the, the way the Buddhist, it's a very di different the way the Buddhists learn, the way the monks learn the Buddhism, Buddhist philosophy, it's purely, the, it's like a scientific method. Now they are the real scientists because, <laughs> now what, what he, what he meant to say is like the, the main way the monks study, uh, the, the methodology of how, the, the pedagogy of what the monks study is purely like a scientific method. Yeah. Made speechless. Oh. And then, uh, when I ask the science advances, that the many people in the world at the long time back, you know, long time back, the many the scholars, they used to say, the Tibetan Buddhist uh, scholars, they used to say that if you study, if you become scholars of the science, if you're good in science, that means you won't be able to, uh, like he met, in fact, those people, uh, those people who said, you know, like who are good in uh, science will not be able to understand the Buddhist philosophy. Now they have been made tongue-tied. The earlier they used to believe that those people who study science are the monks who study science will not be able to explain, especially during the de debating and all dialectic, they won't be able to uh, get a win over this, the opponents. And the many say that, okay, if, as the science, uh, science develops, if the science develops, the Buddhisms will uh, de decline. And one of the reasons, the first, the first time when I met with the scientists, I had two objectives. I have two. I always said I have two objectives. My first objective is my knowledge, okay, to expand our knowledge. There's no, no judgment which one is good or which one is bad. It's non judgmental. For example, in the Buddhist philosophy, when you want to study it, okay, the. When you in the, the comes to the practice, 
uh, when you want to uh, study the subjective knowledge, there's no question of, you know, you have to find the reality. You have to find the reality, the objective. There's no question of uh, judgmental. You have to really study, okay, without any bias. <coughs> so the, the first the first reason, the first objective why I learned science is that our knowledge till now the scientists have really, they objectively, they have studied in depth. Now they are studying in <coughs> deeply and then not only that, they are also studying the human emotions and the different emotions and how it's been functional, how it is related to the ob object, the relationship between the subjective and the objective. And the second uh, aim why I've interacted with a scientist is because when you study the objectives and the chemicals, when we, after studying and learning, then what is the beneficial aspects of all these science we will try to get. For example, medicine, where they have studied the human body, and later on they found out the benefits of all uh, this uh, medical research, and then they expand the knowledge, and then those which are harmful, they reduce it, and they try to block it, they have to stop it, and because of that, because of the chemical, uh, chemical analysis, chemical reaction, and this is the second. And the second one there, you have to have a judgment, you have to decide which one is better, which is good. Like that, when you think about the, the consciousness and the emotions, when you go deep, when you start understanding, when you start understanding what is, we are not talking about the life after death, we are not talking about the nirvana, uh, we are not talking about whether you are up there to, okay, the God, realm of God, in this life, in this world, you know, to like, we want this world, in this whole world, to have a better world, more peaceful world, and a happier world. And when you start understanding the emotions and the consciousness and what is the root cause of what okay, uh, makes the happiness, what, what is the main root cause of, uh, uh, is, is the root cause of uh, suffering? And that we have to know and then we should have the antidote for that and try to, you know, that the causes, we should reduce it, resist it, and then we to uh, try to find out, subdue all those negative emotions, afflictive emotions, and then try to find uh, the better. I have many friends, they have highly expert and highly known, but the scientists who are brain neuroscientists, they are expert scholars, but they himself, but personally, you know, it's a very unhappy and had lots of worries. I had, that's why, so I have the scientists, I have met many scientists who are well known, you know, the emotions, when they start understanding the broad mind, they have to, uh, it is really helpful, the individual scientists, when they start understanding the different aspects of emotions, then it helps the scientists themselves personally to become a better person and more peaceful person. And when, so it's a big problem if the scientist who has a problem, emotional problem, if they work in the laboratory, the result will not be good. A scientist who is well at ease, who is at peace and who is composed, when they work in scientific research, I think it will be a greater research. Research will be more productive. Oh, now this is, uh, you have to be careful, for example, when, you, when I say that the importance of the science doesn't mean that it's more than 50% of your okay, uh, <clears throat> commitment towards the science only. You have to also have a both, it has to be balanced. I say, for example, I have lots of interest in science when I was even uh, in Tibet, uh, even my tutors, you know, I told him then, I used to tell him that, I used to tell him that, okay, uh, even uh, the, my tutors, when the senior tutors used to tell me when young, you know, I used to tell them that I'm interested in science. And even they told me, "Oh, oh that makes sense." And I said, for example, when I say that I try to meditate on emptiness and compassion. That, that, that whenever I get a free leisure hours, I used to, you know, my main purpose and the focus is on the meditation, on the compassions, and all. And then maybe some, you know, there's a hab, say, those who are, you know, who gets interested in science, who engage in science, and sometimes then neglect the meditations and the Buddhist philosophy. The main, the core, <clears throat> the essence is, you know, like, say, it's like a root, is about the uh, understanding contemplative studies and the Buddhist philosophy. On top of that, then 
don't uh, you study the science? Say, for example, I have no science knowledge. I have no basic knowledge on a science, but still, after discussing with the scientist and interactive interactive session with the scientist, then through discussions, then I get some, oh uh, no, like uh, confidence, and then I started studying about this uh, dialectics, and then about the middle way, and then it really helps me personally, and then I think it's very important for the monks also, you should consider you while studying science also, do not neglect studying the Buddhist philosophy. <laughs> Your Holiness, I'd like to uh, introduce or remind you of Diana Chapman Walsh, researcher originally at Harvard University, past president of Wellesley College and a major American university, and she will be our facilitator for the day, so I'll give the chair over to her. Have the microphone on for Diana Chapman Walsh. Could you, hello, yeah. there we go. Takes a minute. Thank you so very much. Thanks to each of you for your eloquent and inspiring opening comments, really beautiful opening statements that have positioned us for these six days together. It's truly a historic moment. Huh? I think we all feel that very keenly, a high intensity moment as we're leaning into our microphones listening so very carefully to your words. Um, we are just thrilled to be a part of this moment, including we new materialists. I have a new role for myself. I'm a new materialist. The new materialists with our minds opened by science and our minds calmed by contemplative practice. So we come to you Having heard these stories this morning of the great personal benefit over these 25 years that have come from these encounters of these two remarkable intellectual traditions, the personal benefits, but also the much closer alignment of our work, those of us who have had the privilege to have these encounters with the Buddhist traditions, with your holiness, the closer alignment of our work with real and urgent needs in the world. So it has both of those extraordinary benefits uh, to all the participants and it's an enormous privilege to be part of it. So my task this morning, I will try to be brief, is just to give you a little sense of the shape and the structure of our program, the intentions that are embedded in the decisions that were made about how we would spend this time together. We've made, everyone who is here has made a serious commitment, a significant commitment of time, and yet it is very brief to cover all of the questions that we hope to at least begin to explore and unearth together. So we've thought carefully about how we can spend our time uh, and again, you will find uh, this in the program. Each morning, we will begin with a, a first session, and we're about now to launch into our first session this morning, now that we have had our welcomes and our orientation. Each morning, we will have a first session in the style and the spirit of the Mind and Life Institute dialogues over this quarter century. So, uh, as His Holiness said, um, he has been off speaking to these scientists and maybe some of his colleagues in the monasteries are wondering what has he been up to? <laughs> so this is an opportunity for all of you to observe firsthand a little bit of the richness of those encounters between His Holiness and uh, other members of the monastic tradition and the scientists from the Western tradition. And we'll do that in just a moment. So every day we'll have the little bit of that as an example, an exemplar. Then every day, the second morning session will be different from that in its intention. It will be more explicitly educational. It will be, in a sense, inaugurating this new era of science education for Tibetan monastics. So we will be celebrating this new era, in a sense, with really exquisite presentations from experts who will bring the distilled essence of their thinking 
There won't be time for them to elaborate or explicate in very much detail, but they will try to bring you little gems of what they have learned from their years and years of deep scientific study. And to really give a kind of a, ignite everyone's um, interest and curiosity about that. It will not obviously be the equivalent of many years of study, but we hope it will have that inspirational quality. And we have a very distinguished faculty. Again, you can read about them in your program. And then each day, the third session will be what we're calling an open discussion. It will be an opportunity for questions to come from the floor, both in this hall, and also we have created a method for questions to come from the remote locations. And they can be posed to any of the speakers who have been present that morning. And so I encourage everyone, if you have a question that you would like to pose to His Holiness or to any of the speakers on a given day, think about uh, what, how to formulate it, and there will be a full hour for that give and take with the audience. And then the fourth session every day after dinner uh, will again be educational in its design and its purpose. So we will have speakers Uh, who will again bring a topic and explore it carefully and in a way that those who are not as familiar with it will, we hope, be able to follow uh, and, and think about its implications. Of course, we hope that everything we do here will be educational in some fundamental sense, educational for all of us, and that, of course, is the great opportunity that we have before us. So the arc of the week in terms of its conceptual organization begins this morning with uh, a, a more uh, general introductory session. And then the next days we delve more and more deeply into specific topic areas, so physics, neuroscience, and so on. And again, that's well described in the program. I'll begin, Your Holiness. And I'll begin first by reminding you that you asked for the content of this Mind and Life event that there would be three topics. The topics would be modern, modern physics, in particular quantum mechanics, and we'll also weave in some relativity theory. The second topic was neuroscience, which Richie Davidson, Tanya Singer, and others will speak to. And the third topic is consciousness research, which Christoph Koch, Matthew Ricard, and Michel Bitbo will speak to as well. So this is our scientific program. And we can only, of course, begin what is a huge and, and uh, challenging field of study. But I hope that the monastics here will get a flavor for these three remarkable fields of modern research, which you have found so interesting. We'll also be speaking at the very end about applications, particularly applications of mindfulness in the areas of clinical work and in education. So that one can see that the fruits of this, what seems to be very abstract, perhaps, study between Buddhist thought and science actually has already shown to have great fruits in the world. I'd like to begin by uh, showing a picture of a very young scientist This is probably from about 1945, 43, something in there, who made a discovery. <laughs> Do you recognize the scientist? <laughs> you tell the story in one of your books of how you looked for the rabbit in the moon. <laughs> We look for the man in the moon, but you began by looking. This is a very important lesson, that we need to begin by looking. But you not only looked, you began to think about what you saw. You began to apply reason. These two, to look and to reason, are the foundations for science, the foundations for knowledge. And when you looked and reasoned, you saw something that perhaps no other Tibetan had ever seen. You saw that there was a light source 
namely the sun casting a shadow from the mountains on the moon and you inferred in the way that you would be then schooled in later you inferred that there was an external source of light illuminating the moon casting shadows in this remarkable beautiful way that you you saw as the rabbit in the moon <laughs> not just you but of course your whole culture you know some years earlier in Italy there was a similar such observation which took place this is Galileo Galilei and in 1609 with a telescope which he made himself you had the 13th Dalai Lama's telescope I think so you didn't have to make one Galileo had to make one because the telescope had only just been invented and so he put together his telescope and did exactly what you did he looked and over three weeks he drew a picture a picture of what he saw were the phases of the moon, the shadows that were cast and just as you did he inferred that the moon was moving about the earth illuminated by the sun and that there were in fact mountains on the moon prior to this people thought that the moon did not have mountains but he discovered them you could say by his seeing and his reasoning he also looked at other objects in the sky Jupiter and its moons he really was one of the most significant and perhaps profoundest of our scientists who changed the entire history of Western scientific investigation now in 1633 so some years later the church the Catholic Church put him on trial for heresy because yeah because what he saw and what he reasoned was contrary to religious belief he refused to really recant he refused to, to deny his inferences and he stayed with what he saw was the truth they threatened him with torture with death and finally they put him into prison through the intervention of a friend they made him stay in his house and so the last nine years of his life for these truths he was confined to his own small house I see you haven't been confined to your small house you haven't been tried for heresy but fortunately <laughs> the Dalai Lama's name gives you a certain privilege yes but I hope that many many other monks and nuns will look through the telescopes and will also uh, reason about what they saw I, I tell these two stories not only because they're so similar I can see by the way you're looking at the microphone that you have great interest in yeah, electronics <laughs> Like if you have not uh, heard, and I'm going to explain, most probably, I remember, most probably in the year 1958, uh, most probably 58 or 57, uh, that uh, the previous Dalai Lama's, there's a huge, a huge telescope, and I used to go out during the daytime, especially when I was in the roof of the Potala, and then I used to view through the telescope, and there's nothing else to view. And when in Nubalinga, uh, there's a place called Nam De Gong uh, on the, the, you know, the moon. I used to view the moon and the moon and the stars, moon and the stars. Moons and stars, I used to go up on Nubling. So, uh, the, okay, so, as, uh, so the, the, the explained, uh, when I don't, you know, like at that time, I don't, uh, you know, believe that there's a moon. I mean, like wrap it up on the moon. But when I look, view through the telescope to the moon, you know, the, the, the mountains. 
okay the dried lake and then and then from the side the mountain ranges and during the night when i viewed when the sun sets when sun sets and the 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 reflection of the sun rays falls and then of the directions of the shadows towards the east the you know sees the changes in the shadows there on the moon then it he he, he infers he would decided he concluded that you know it's all because of the reflection of the sun rays up there thank you thank you one evening it was bright and then the tutor got confirmed you know the belief in he agreed what i said and then it's like another girl oh. and just now you have explained about it comparatively to the galileos and now i've realized in it yeah preliminary practices which involve making mandala offerings offering the whole universe and the conception of the universe is based on Abhidhamma with a Mount Meru in the middle so when the Dalai Lama says there is no such thing as Mount Meru some people might think you know, <laughs> what is his business you know talking oh. you know, we're doing this practice and he's saying that Mount Meru doesn't exist quite sufficient sort of reasons to give punishment <laughs> 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 I tell this story because the relationship between science and religion is perhaps one of the most important relationships in civilization. Alfred North Whitehead was one of America's and England's most important philosophers. And in 1925, so, you know, nearly a century ago, he said this about the relationship between the two of these said, when we consider what religion is for mankind, how important it has been, how religion has been so, so important, and what science is also profoundly important, it is no exaggeration to say that the future course of history depends upon the decision of this generation as to the relations between them. The course of history will be determined by whether we come to a right relationship or a wrong relationship between religion and science. And I think, Your Holiness, that this is one of the great public services, a kind of task that you have done, a kind of achievement, that through your person you have convened scientists with contemplative scholars and practitioners, that religion and science have come together on a common ground in a way that has not led to prison, but has led to enlightenment in some small way. I think this cannot be exaggerated in its importance. Not, this is perhaps not fully evident here in this monastic community, but your work in the West, in Europe, the United States in particular, has given an entirely different picture of how religion and science can come together as friends we need not be enemies, we need not fight with one another, much less put each other in prison. And this quote which Diana Chapman Walsh read in part, for me, brings these two together in exactly the right way, where one says, not so long ago, think of Galileo, many people viewed science's objective knowledge and the subject of understanding of Buddhist inner science as mutually exclusive. But a combination of these two can provide the complete conditions for attaining real human happiness. As a consequence, Mind and Life has taken up this really exciting and profoundly important task of bringing these two worlds together in a way that does provide positive <coughs> progress towards human flourishing. It has done so by publications of the dialogues which we've had together so that they do not remain only among a small number. And in 2003, you'll remember, Your Holiness, that we had an important meeting at MIT, the first public meeting at which some of the research that Richie was describing 
was presented. The interest that came from that meeting, especially by young people, young scientists, was enormous. As a consequence, we started the Summer Research Institute, primarily for young scholars, scientists, and it's an integrated program of research topics and meditation, East and West, contemplative and scientific. We also started Young Investigators Awards, the Francisco Varela Awards. You remember not long ago we were together in Rochester and you had an opportunity to meet six of these remarkable young scientists. And so these are the fruits of that work we've done together, fruits that have been cared for by the Board of Trustees of the Mind and Life Institute with whom you periodically meet and give counsel on what it is we undertake. I'd like to stop here by way of introduction and by way also of kind of a gratitude, a deep gratitude for your leadership, not only of this monastic community, but your leadership on a world issue, a problem which really confronts the entire globe going forward. I know you do this in modesty and you do this with great humor and joy, but you should know that we understand its significance. Your Holiness, uh one of the themes that uh, you have requested that we consider at our time together is the theme of neuroscience and also a related theme of consciousness. Uh, these themes have been a part of the Mind and Life dialogues from the very beginning. And uh, with uh, uh, all due respect to my wonderful colleagues in physics, I think that the the, the practical consequences of the dialogue with neuroscience have been very evident in the stimulation of actual research, uh, which has been very exciting uh, and I think extremely important for uh, so many different areas. And I'd like to begin by just asking the question, why has neuroscience been such a vibrant uh, opportunity for uh, the dialogue between science and Buddhism. And I think that at its very root, many of the questions that have been historically among the most important in certain branches of neuroscience are really questions that also, I think, are central to Buddhism. Questions such as, is there a self? Where might it be located? Questions like, is all thought conceptual? What is the difference between, or the relation between perception and cognition? What is the difference between afflictive? So uh, regarding the issue of perception and cognition, uh, one of the questions that neuroscientists have been particularly concerned with is the extent to which the brain provides a faithful and veridical representation of the external world? Or is it more the case that the brain constructs reality in some way? Uh, this is a question that we'll be hearing more about over the course of this week. Uh, and uh, some of the implications of neuroscientific research related to that question Will, will become apparent. Also, a, a question that you frequently ask, Your Holiness, what is the difference between non-conceptual and conceptual mental activity? And is there a difference in the brain where we can distinguish between them? Is also, it's a question that scientists, neuroscientists, are beginning to ask as well. Uh, also, the question of whether there is a difference and what the difference might be between afflictive and non-afflictive emotions has been very central. But I think perhaps the most important issue is that I think that we could say that the third noble truth in Buddhism really, I think, from a neuroscientific perspective, is fundamentally concerning the possibility of neuroplasticity, that is, the possibility of change. 
And uh, the fact of neuroplasticity, the fact that the brain can change in response to experience and in response to training provides us with, at least in scientific terms, some idea about how the path of liberation might actually occur, how we might find a way out of suffering. Because if the brain can change in these ways, perhaps this provides some important insights about how suffering may actually be reduced. Uh, and so I think this is an area where there has been a terrifically important connection between uh, the study of the brain uh, and, and Buddhism. So uh, I would like to um, uh, introduce this topic uh, with just a, a few uh, facts about the brain uh, and then um, uh, uh, some illustrations to show that when we go about our world and information comes through the senses, much of that information may be processed by the brain, but is not necessarily conscious. Uh, but yet it still affects the brain in important ways and can change the autonomic nervous system in wage, ways which may influence our health. Uh, and this gives us some insight about what the role of conscious awareness might be in um, uh, our uh, minds and brains, which will be the, a topic that we'll consider in detail in the next few days. So, um, one of the things that we're learning about the human brain is that it's probably the most complicated piece of matter that exists in the universe, or at least on this planet. Um, there are more than 20,000 genes which are expressed in the brain uh, that play a role in the activities uh, of the brain. There are more than 100,000 distinct types of uh, cells and uh, constituents that we find in the brain. Uh, these are uh, distinct um, physical entities that play a role in the operation of the brain. Uh, that's approximately the number of brain cells in the human brain. Uh, and this is approximately the number of connections uh, among those brain cells. Uh, so it is a vastly complicated uh, um, piece of matter. Uh, and the honest truth is that scientists have very little idea uh, about how this actually works at this point in time. Uh, our, our knowledge is, is really um, uh, in a very early stage. There are really an astronomical number of ensembles of these are collections of cells that accomplish specific types of tasks. Uh, we don't know how many mental states there are. It could be a virtually unlimited number of mental states. Um, not in terms of category, episodes, yes. A millimeter cubed is approximately the size of the top of a pin. And there are approximately 20 to 30,000 neurons or brain cells in that little space of the head of a, of a pin. There are, in that same amount of space, there are approximately four kilometers of axons, which are the connections between brain cells, in just the size of the tip of a pin, approximately four kilometers. And then there are a very large number of synapses, which are the physical connections that exist among cells in the brain. So all of this is just to emphasize that this is really, really complicated. 
uh, and uh, there are a huge number of interacting parts. And uh, one of the challenges for scientists is to better understand how this all works together. And that is still very much uh, a, uh, an open question uh, which we're at very early stages with. One of the areas of the brain, each, each of our neuroscientists has a favorite area of the brain that he or she studies. This is one of the areas that I study a lot. Uh, it's that little purple spot, uh, and it's called the amygdala. Uh, and uh, you've heard, Your Holiness, about the amygdala on many other occasions, and it seems to play an important role in afflictive emotions, particularly, although it plays a role in all emotions. Now, we're beginning to learn a little bit about the connections that that area of the brain makes with other areas of the brain. And in this next slide, this depicts all of the known connections. Every one of these lines is a verified connection that exists between the amygdala, which is right in the middle. That's this area right here. And every line is a known connection between this structure and each of these numerical and letter um, uh, positions represent a different part of the brain. So this is illustrating just the connections of this tiny little structure uh, with other parts of the brain. Uh, and again, it underscores how extraordinarily interconnected this is. And again, uh, we're still at very, very early stages of this work. Now, one of the things that neuroscientists are learning is that in, in, in a very real sense, the brain constructs our experience of reality. It does not faithfully represent the outside or the in, inside world, but it transforms information uh, and represents it in this transformed way. And so what we experience uh, in our seeing or in our hearing is not a faithful representation of what exists outside. And so, for example, we know that certain animals can hear things that humans cannot hear. Uh, we know that they can see in certain ranges of light that humans cannot see, and yet those influences are still present in humans, and some of them can still influence the brain, albeit in ways that we're not necessarily conscious of. So one of the um, uh, kinds of experiments that um, neuroscientists do, and this is a demonstration that I showed uh, in Delhi, uh, and this is what we call the attentional blink, which is a, um, uh, an experience that people have very often where uh, something might occur in the environment and they're simply not aware of it and it's as if their mind was not paying attention. Uh, their mind was fixated on one thing and they were unable, therefore, to see another thing. Uh, this is an occurrence which happens a lot and the reason why neuroscientists have become so interested in this particularly those who are interested in the dialogue with Buddhism, is because one of the hypotheses or one of the um, invitations from the Buddhist tradition that we've learned is that some of these qualities that neuroscientists have studied may not necessarily be obligatory properties of the nervous system. They may be, they may be potentially trainable. That is, we may be able to actually enhance our attention in ways which allow us to see things that many people may not necessarily see. So in the attentional blink, and we can actually do this little experiment, uh, if everyone just looks at this cross, and I will be showing a series of letters and numbers, and just pay attention to the numbers, and uh, I'll ask, which numbers that you saw? Was the number one presented? How many people saw the number one? 
number two, number three, number, number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay. Uh, so what was actually shown is, but it is a little more difficult for most people to see the seven. So the way this worked is I presented a series of letters, then the number three occurred, and then there are one or two letters, and then again the number seven. People get so excited about seeing the three that they fail to see the seven very often. So it turns out that three months of Vipassana meditation practice improves a person's ability to see the second number, to see the number seven. So we know this has been an important observation because it teaches us that in contrast to what neuroscientists first thought, which is that this is an obligatory property of the nervous system, that the nervous system goes into some refractory mode, where meaning that uh, it's taking a rest. After seeing that first number, it kind of shuts down to restore itself. Then it then can see the next number. What this observation suggests is that these are, at least to some extent, malleable. They're plastic. They can undergo change through training. Now, another example scientists call change blindness. What I'm going to show here is a series of pictures. And uh, there will be a slight change from one picture to the other. And see if you can, just by looking at these pictures very attentively, notice where the change is. So I'll show them a few times. Did anyone notice a change? I'll show it once more. Now I'll show it in slower motion so that you can actually see better what changed. Now, if you notice um, in the corner here, uh, there was a little sign uh, that initially in the first image was, um, was on and then it turned off. So I'll show another example. I'll show it again and then I'll slow it down. And if you notice, there was a light at the top. Uh, I'll do it once more. The light was present and then it went off. Now, I'll show it once more so everyone can see it. The light at the top and then goes off. Most people uh, or often fail to see this, this change. Uh, and again, studies have shown that meditation practice, certain kinds of meditation practice, can actually influence this capacity. <laughs> so another area where we see this is um, in detecting very subtle facial expressions. And you know your friend Paul Ekman has been one of the leading scientists uh, in this area. And what I'd like to show now is just a couple of faces and just um, very quickly see what your impression is in terms of which face looks more happy or more friendly, the first or the second. So here's one, and I'll show it to you. Another one, and tell me which looks happier, the first or the second. How many people thought the first looks happy? How many people thought the second looked happier? OK, I'll show you what I actually displayed. So what was displayed is and then that. So it was first a fear face, then a neutral face. And in the second case, what I displayed was this. A smiling face, and then a neutral face. And so it turns out that these facial expressions can influence your judgment of a neutral face, even though you may not be aware. And one of the questions that we're investigating with the, um, the intersection of Buddhism and neuroscience is whether individuals who've trained their mind are better able 
to uh, see these very fine details in these kinds of images where um, untrained minds may be less able to detect these very subtle differences. We, we test that first. We yes. test the eyesight. Uh, very important, yes. <laughs> so I'd like to just um, uh, end with a few, word, a few additional words about um, the brain as a source of both delusion and insight. The, the, the idea that the brain constructs reality suggests that it never faithfully represents the external or internal worlds. And delusion, which is something that we, we I think, can really profit from the intersection of neuroscience and Buddhism, uh, delusion. distorted perception, but also potentially afflictive. Uh, so delusion can result from distortions created by emotions, which can influence our perception, our beliefs, and our expectations. The way in which you're using the word constructivist, are you already suggesting that you are at the level of thought, or is it still constructive construction could be taking place at the Pre-conscious level. Uh, absolutely, pre-conscious, yes. Not, not necessarily at the level of thought. Yes. She's wondering, you know, the, the word construction. Um, you know, His Holiness is uh, relating, you know, this whole notion of construct construction versus uh, faithful representation. Uh, he's trying to correlate that with the Buddhist debate about whether when mental perceptions or mental processes represent uh, reality, uh, is it just a one-to-one -one mirroring without any mediation or whether um, you know, the mental processes imposes a form as a medium to kind of organize the material and perceive it. So there is that discussion. But uh, the, the construction here. Is okay, so then there is also just, it, it has um, implications for whether what we perceive uh, is actually uh, uh, kind of faithful to what is there, or, or whether it's a form of a distortion. Anyway. Size illusion would be a good example. Yes. Um, Arthur was going to show some uh, uh, slides oh illustrating, uh, illustrating uh, the, um, the idea that sometimes things may look a different size, okay. but they're actually the same size, but because of the context in which they're embedded, can they can look smaller image? or larger. Richie, can you just get that can image there? Please? Sure. This is, this is from Arthur. This is from Arthur. Arthur, do you want to describe it? I'll, I'll be your projection man. <laughs> so, Your Holiness, you'll see here two monsters, and they're in a hallway. Which is bigger? Don't what do you... Is the front... Is the first one bigger or the second the one in the back bigger? Good. Okay, let's let's show the uh, next slide. Oops. There's an arrow. Whoop! Don't go too fast. There's an arrow which is the same size here. Go slowly. All right. So I've moved the arrow. They are the same size. Most people would judge the back one to look bigger than the front one. Go to the next. Here you have three soldiers. Which soldier is taller? Most people would judge the soldier on the left to be taller than the soldier on the right. But again, that's right. Richie, could you go to the next? Because of the line. Okay, now another move. That's it. And then one more. These are actually all the same size, but as you say, Your Holiness, because of the lines that are on the, I don't know whose microphone's rustling, but 
because of the lines in the background, you judge the size relative to the context. All right, so what you're seeing and judging as a cognition is not a veridical or accurate representation of the physical size, but it's a subjective impression. So because in Buddhism, uh, Buddhist uh, epistemological text, there's a lot of discussion of various forms of perceptual illusions and where the source of illusion lies. So this one would be categorized as the source of illusion lying in the actual context or the object in the field. So the object. The, yeah, field. Go, go a, a little further. Can you skip to the, uh, the, the Fraser spiral? Just to give a kind of fun. We'll conclude this with a final uh, demonstration. It's called the Fraser spiral. Here, Your Holiness, one sees, most people will see a spiral where the, it's a kind of circle that goes in towards the center, right? Where it gets smaller and smaller. I'm going to put a spot, a star, if you hit just once, on the top. You can see the star at the top. And now we're going to move at the top of the spiral. There's a star, a red star. Yeah, okay, now we're going to move it around the spiral and follow it. Notice it goes to the same place. You can go back if you want and then forward again. Just backwards. And that's it, there it goes again. So if you trace your finger around the spiral, it's not a spiral, it's actually a circle. If, um, same distance, yeah. It's spiral You see a spiral, but if you draw your finger, you move your finger, there is it's only a circle. So in in the in reality, on the right hand side in the lower, you'll see that there's a series of concentric circles in the lower right. So it's basically a concentric circle. It's a set of concentric no, circles. No difference in no the distance. Difference, yeah. So this, is, you know, is some evidence concerning the relation between perception and cognition. You know, what is it one sees? What is it one cognizes and knows? And it raises many interesting philosophical issues. Uh, Your Holiness, I wanted to just review another very important point that um, some scientists have called mental time travel. Uh, what we mean by that is that human beings have the capacity to reflect about the future and also to reflect on the past. Uh, a very well-known neuroscientist who you've met, Your Holiness, at Stanford by the name of Robert Sapolsky wrote a very famous book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the idea uh, that is captured there is that because human beings have the capacity to reflect on the past and anticipate the future, they spend a considerable amount of time worrying, ruminating about the past and worrying about events that may occur in the future rather than being in the present moment. In fact, a recent scientific study observed in, in a large sample of American adults approximately 47% of their waking time, they were not actually attending to what they, were, what they were doing. Their mind was wandering. They were either ruminating about the past or anticipating the future. They actually, 47% of the time, they were not focused on what they were doing. So, of, of course, so if, if you're in that... So if you're in that wandering mind state, so you can't achieve much. For example, you can't study well or do yes, any research. May, may, may be, that may be a significant contributor to the problems in education in the United States, why we're number 27 uh, in, uh, uh, in educational success and achievement. Uh, it's, it's a big, we, th we think it may be a very big problem. So his Solon is wondering whether that research, uh, this um, has taken into account the difference 
of television viewing habit of, say, for example, people in the urban areas in the United States and the rural areas? Are you aware of that? The, uh, all of these um, individuals in the United States in both rural and urban areas, there, there would be access to television. Uh, and so um, uh, I don't think television exposure necessarily... Uh, we don't know the answer to that. I, you know, I think that um, this is based on about 5,000 individuals, so it's representative, but we, there's a lot of variation among people. But I think even if you asked academics who are very focused in their work, um, have, have we had experiences reading a book, for example, uh, we're, we're reading a book and we turn a page and not, not actually know what was on the page that we just read. Um, I think if we're really honest with ourselves, many of us have had that experience uh, of the mind. <laughs> so it's only saying that if scientists acquire that kind of habits, then it's <laughs> slightly worrying. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disaster. <laughs> <laughs> you will never find a reality for <laughs> the, the reason I bring this issue up in a neuroscientific context is because the prefrontal cortex, this very large um, uh, mass, which actually over the course of evolution, uh, has grown the most in human beings compared to any other species. So if you look at the relation between the size of the prefrontal cortex in relation to the remainder of the brain mass, that ratio is larger in humans than it is in any other species. And scientists believe that it's because of the evolution of the prefrontal cortex that allows us to anticipate the future as well as to reflect on the past. Those are skills which clearly are beneficial for many things that we do, but they also can get us into trouble. Uh, and that is why we are more likely to get ulcers than zebras, because we, are, we have the capacity to worry about the future and ruminate about the past in a way that other species do not. And it is because of the evolution of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, it has given us that ability, but it also gets us into difficulties um, because of that. The object of your distraction may be, can, can be anything, but the mind just loses its focus and gets distracted. Well, it w we would make a distinction among certain kinds of distractors. So, for example, you can be distracted by a sound. Uh, if you heard your name being called, uh, you can orient, you focus your attention. Uh, that's a certain kind of distraction. Then what the kind of distraction that we're talking about is more of an internal distraction. It's a distraction from our thoughts and our emotions, uh, which pull us either to the future or to the past. Not him, not him. Because the senses, you know, the you know, senses versus the thoughts, the senses are very present oriented. They cannot turn <laughs> back, turn yes. back or you know, project into the future. So it's really a thought at the level yes, of thought. Uh, yes, exactly. So one of the um, one of the questions uh, which um, is so important in this area of research is whether the contemplative traditions may have uh, some useful exercises for us or useful uh, strategies for, uh, in some sense, harnessing the potential that human beings are born with uh, to use them for more constructive purposes. So uh, rather than getting distracted in this way and having our minds wander uh, to uh, harness that capacity for, um, uh, for, for specific beneficial purposes in a focused way. And so one of the 
um, areas of active investigation in what we call contemplative neuroscience is how contemplative practices may influence this area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, in ways which um, enable uh, this area of the brain to uh, work in a way which is more beneficial rather than being uh, uh, afflictive. So uh, I will end here, and I can just uh, end with a question for Your Holiness about um, uh, whether uh, there are specific um, elements uh, or uh, strategies in the Buddhist tradition which you think uh, would be particularly applicable uh, in this context uh, uh, for that, that scientists might investigate in, uh, uh, in this area. So you have already done quite a bit of research on, um, you know, adepts, meditators. So His Holiness is wondering... So no matter what object, if you're supposed to see training, the mind focusing on yes. one specific point of view. Way long. Oh. Yes. Yes, and this has been a very fruitful uh, area of scientific investigation. And now there are several very good studies published in, in the scientific literature that show uh, that certain types of meditation can be beneficial in focusing the mind in this way and may reduce the propensity of human beings uh, to, to show this mind wandering. Uh, it may help focus the mind in that way. We still, there's still so many questions uh, uh, and about how um, the, this area of the brain, the prefrontal cortex is influenced. And also uh, uh, what, what I wanted to end on is, is really the big questions which still are uh, as mysterious as they were at the very beginning of this enterprise, which is how is it that our experience may actually emerge out of the, um, the neural matter that constitutes our brain, which of course is a conjecture, a hypothesis, or a, uh, if you will, a bias that neuroscientists often begin with. Uh, that is a question that uh, still is as mysterious as it was um, two or three centuries ago. Uh, we also uh, uh, have um, very little sense of whether it may be possible for consciousness to exist uh, without this material substrate, and this is an issue, or, or at least without the material substrate that is the conventional material substrate that neuroscientists believe uh, is the key to understanding consciousness. That's an issue that we know almost nothing about. Uh, and so, uh, one of the things I find most helpful in my own laboratory is just to, for us all to remind ourselves about these big questions uh, that we know so little about to help cultivate a little bit more humility as we navigate this difficult set of questions. in your living room in Dharamsala, gathered around a table in an intimate conversation, and you had just heard from these two colleagues about how very complicated their topics are, what would you ask them to go away and do? What charge would you give them as they... <laughs> The area where we need more inspiration is the distinction between conceptual and non-conceptual consciousness. And also uh, sense uh, consciousness. Uh, we We have, a, we have a position that on the level of conceptual thought, uh, the, uh, the, the appearance and the conceptualization kind of become blended, whereas that's not the case on the faculties, on the sense faculties. 
So in this regard, uh, uh, an area to investigate would be that of slave state because that's free from conceptual thoughts. Yet it has, the, it has. That's an area where it is purely non non sensory, non non sensual, and yet at the same time where thoughts have a play. And so it would be interesting uh, to uh, uh, look at that area and then see whether one could come up uh, with. A greater, greater, clear understanding of the distinction between the conceptual uh, mental processes and processes that are not conceptual, not thought-related. So, uh, so this is an important... No, sensors of organs uh, are the, the conceptual memory. So, for example, like all the sensory experiences mm -hmm. in the Buddhist epistemology uh, seem mm -hmm. to be um, beyond the level of thought. So it's, mm -hmm. it's not a conceptual process, it's a sensory process. <laughs> Like here, when I look at the paper in front of me, it sees only whatever is presented there up front and cannot see things go a little past or in coming in the future, whereas that's not the case. One visual perception of this booklet on the table right now, what the visual perception uh, really perceives is this very particular, you know, uh, uh, present moment existence of that object on the table, that book. Um, whereas when you close your eyes and you think about this book, then th you're at the level of thought, in the realm of thought, where then there is mm. a conflation of time and space. So then you're no longer focused on a particular, you know, uh, phenomenon. So there is that distinction. Mm. So it's only no. so for saying that uh, in a one possible occasion for uh, a, a good opportunity for research is in, uh, in the dream state when someone is sleeping, because during that state uh, most of the actually the, all the sensory modalities are quietened. So whatever process that's happening would be at the level of this mental, not sensory. Um, you know, visual, sensory, and auditory, they're all kind of switched off. And then furthermore, if you go down to the deepest sleep level, then again one would expect, you know, different mental processes. Therefore, you know, if one can see the brain signatures and the differences in the brain activity, you know, that might actually show us a better way of teasing out what are the specific unique signatures of...